streamed in over 50 countries. We have to say hello to, to Nigel in Hong Kong, who single-handedly managed to get us to, wait for this, Dan, number nine, <laughs> number nine on the Apple podcast charts for British football shows in Hong Kong. Over 40 guest interviews and counting. We would like to welcome to the St. Johnson podcast, ex-Scotland internationalist and all-round hero, Del Boy, John O'Neill. It's the Dogger Saints' pleasure to introduce Liam Craig, Michael Jubilee, the St. Johnson legend, Stephen Anderson. How you doing, buddy? You okay? I'm all right, just doing away, do you? Hall of Fame member, Nick Dazovich. How are you guys doing? Over 3,000 pounds worth of terrible merchandise disgust. But it is a dog waste bag dispenser. <laughs> with a bomb with badge on it. <laughs> Join Sam and Dan as they chat about the mighty Perth St. Johnstone. Stephen Anderson scores! It's come through to McLean! He has scored! It's on the clock! It's the Dogger Saints Podcast. Hello, one and all. Welcome back. It's episode 46 of Dogger Saints, the unofficial St. Johnson podcast. And I am joined once again by a man who at Kelty on Saturday called a man a specky twat, Stanny Williams. I'm going to correct you now. Go on. It was a fucking specky twat. <laughs> well, that's what he gets for trying to be the B- Billy Big Time. Ah, that's it. Yeah, you, know, you, you might beat us at football, but when it comes to childish insults, remember he's the fucking daddy. Indeed, you are. I'll tell you who the daddy is. It's Flonix for once again supporting the podcast. If the low, I will just hold that right there for now. You gotta wait. That's just a little preview, a little snippet. Indeed. I used to get on iTunes. Oh. And then you pay your 79 pence and you get the full thing. I tell you what I found was I was raking through an old box of receipts and I was up in the attic, which uh, looking through old box and I found Lynn's diary from 1997, which is going to be our new feature, by the way. Oh, oh, she'll love that. Oh, I think. Oh. Yeah. Which leads me on to my first point. In fact, my first, my first appeal of the episode. Go on. If anyone out there is a divorce lawyer, <laughs> or knows a good divorce lawyer, just preemptively get hold of Sam. Yeah, it could be good fun. We want to talk about as much non St. Johnson related um, content as possible. So we're thinking, let's read a couple of pages of Lynn's diary from 1987. It could be good fun. Uh, but my point was, uh, in the, in her diary was a bookmark from when she bought Pure, Pure and Simple by Hearsay on CD single for three ninety nine from Virgin Megastore in Falkirk. That's an expensive old... Three ninety nine for a single? Three ninety nine, dollars yeah. Crazy, yeah. I remember singles. You felt jibbed of you getting charged one ninety nine for it. Yeah, three ninety nine. Three ninety nine was EP price, and seven ninety nine for an album. Outrageous. But this leads us back to Flonix, who are supporting us this week. Um, if you watch the Kelly game at home on your laptop and decide to throw it through a through a wall, maybe these are the guys to speak to because they offer flexible IT support, professional IT project delivery, and expert IT advice. These are the guys. Uh, yeah, absolutely tremendous. And we're so grateful to, to Dan and everyone at Phonix for, for supporting us, for keeping the lights on at Dogger HQ for, for another week. So oh, fantastic and much appreciated. So if you do um, require their services, please go and check them out. We can absolutely vouch for them. Good stuff. And uh, another thing I've sorted out, IT solution of my own, uh, subscribers. You've noticed you've not received anything through because we've had an issue with our subscribing, but you haven't been charged the last month but that'll be up and running again, and you're all going to be sent through a special gift through the post. Every single subscriber. How nice is that? What a lovely thing. What an absolute... We're just, we're just too adorable, Sam. If you want in on this gift action, if you want in on the on the, the weekly newsletter, or the newsy L, as we've come to describe it, <laughs> and if you want the videos and exclusive interviews, we do, you got to dougasaints.com, not the contact section. You got the subscribe button. You hit subscribe, and you come and get on board. You get on this wild ride. You did. I only came, I only came up with that. You. Sorry to interrupt. I only came up with the idea of gifting them because I've been obviously at home. This is day eight of my um, what do I call this self isolation. I've got the old Miley Cyrus, which hasn't been good. So, but I did miss Tyne Castle away and Kelty away, which was a bonus. Let's talk about them very very briefly. How was your How was your weekend done at Kelty? I think you're the lucky one. In all honesty having the mile <laughs> this week um yeah we'll go for we'll come to the weekend in a minute 
uh, because I think that's going to be the one we end up spending a bit more sort of time on through the episode. Um, yeah, I was went to Tyne Castle, not so much full of hope, but with the new signings and with a little bit of a break, I genuinely, I, I went in positive, in a positive frame of mind. I thought we're playing a good side at their place, but I actually thought we played okay <laughs> against Hearts, but in terms of actually looking a bit more positive, I thought McPherson, who I'm sure will come on to in a bit because he's been in, in the, the sort of subject of a bizarre transfer saga um, over the last couple of days. I thought McPherson using a different role was excellent. I thought Chifty had a really good debut. should have scored, actually, when it was 0-0, but um, I thought he looked good. And, yeah, I thought generally we were better, but just two really poor goals to give away. Yeah, you just know when we go one down, referee might as well just blow the whistle there and then because we're, we're just, we're not coming back. Again, though, even when we went one down, I thought we looked more positive this time, but then second goal killed it. But I was quite hopeful thinking, I'm, I'm still bizarrely of the mind to think one result, I'm trying to think of the best way of putting this. I'm not saying one result and it all turns around, but until we get that result, we don't know what effect that's going to have on, on sort of confidence. So even a win against fourth division semi-professional Kelsey Hearts in the first round, well, sorry, the first hurdle, the fourth round of the cup we're defending, maybe be a good opportunity. I know they're, good, they're having a good season at their level and probably are way above that level already. But it, yeah, that, that went badly, like, that went badly wrong. <laughs> It really did. Uh, we'll put the Hearts game to bed. Another defeat. Uh, we've got Dundee on Wednesday, which we'll talk about at great length later on. Yeah, very quickly before we get on with everything. The Hearts game, um, generally of the view, the way they're... Because then this Dundee game coming up, we'll talk about it later. I actually think that's way bigger. And also Dundee United sort of coming up as well. Teams that are around us are... We're genuinely in a situation where teams around us are the bigger sort of fish to fry. And third place Hearts... I know every game's massive because of the run we're on and every point's a prisoner. Hearts, I'm, I'm almost tempted to say right off. Third place in the league, we're not they're not we're not gonna finish anywhere near them in the league this season. So Yeah, you can't be too upset about uh, losing the hearts there. They're a, a formidable opponent, especially at Tynecastle this season. We've got a packed show though, Dan. Packed to the rafters. Stacked actors, packed to the rafters. Line up the bastards, all I want is the truth. I, I don't know who that is. Well, I maybe wouldn't call them. And maybe while I wouldn't call people bastards, there's some people in our sights today. There certainly is. Uh, we're actually going to talk about CDSA Johnson stuff because it has been an emotional roller coaster the last 48 hours on, on the interweb. Giving idiots a voice since 2001. <laughs> it's been utter carnage. The St. Johnston banter page has been especially wonderful um everything from the the guy who got a slice of pizza from <laughs> callum booth which seems to be doing the rounds now as a, as a running joke which is quite funny but it yeah, was it was nice it was nasty scenes at kelty but we'll go back to we've got pack show absolutely pack show we've got tam scoby coming up we've got a uh, lynn's dying in 1997 our new feature coming up which probably, <laughs> which, which is unlikely to last past one episode we have got georgia boyle in the royal we have got wendy who we have got the blame game who indeed is responsible for St. Johnson's downturn in form? Is it the chairman? Is it the manager? Is it the players? We will take each in turn and have a look to see where the blame may lie. But as the point of recording, there's been some transfer news, which has been welcomed, I would say. It's amazing what one good performance can can do for you in the eyes of the fans, isn't it? <laughs> um, including myself, because today completed the permanent signing after a little bit of a Farago over the weekend in which... Um, St. Mirren and Jim Goodwin have come out smelling of shite. Top shite baggery, that, eh? that's horrible for the ah, players. It's just... top shite. I'm, I, I almost admire it, but at the same time, I don't think I'm in the mood to sort of laugh at much after Saturday. No. Um, yeah, we signed Cammy McPherson on a permanent deal. Obviously, he's been with us since the start of the season long. And a little bit of a, a truncated time with, with injuries, um, in fairness to the lad. He put in and I'm, I can say this now, and I don't feel bad about it because I'm actually going to be nice about him. He put in what I described as the worst midfield performance of all time at Dens Park, which didn't help his cause. Horrible. He was 
it was horrible. It was horrible to watch. I actually felt sorry for him. I was like, just just pull him. Just pull him off for his own pull him off. <laughs> um, just get him Whoa. off. <laughs> that would that would have cheered him. That would have cheered him. Most um, people most people got an orange segment at halftime. <laughs> Jeez, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um take him off for his own good. But actually, I mentioned him at his performance at Tynecastle. I'm gonna come out and say it. I think he's been misused up to now. Yeah, so hopefully that's somebody in the midfield uh, we can rely on to, in the closing parts of the season. But before we get into the Kelty match and everything else that's kind of gone a wee bit wrong this season, should we just do a competition? Yeah, go on. Let's, let's, listeners, we're going to warn you now, this is probably going to be the most bipolar sort of episode of podcasting you've ever heard because we are going to go from one big stream to the other, but we'll, we'll have a little light relief at the start. Yeah, so here we go. It's our weekly competition it's Wendy Who. Wendy, Wendy Who, Wendy Who, yeah. Wendy, Wendy Who, Wendy Who, yeah. Who's it gonna be? Wendy, Wendy Who, Wendy Who, yeah. Who's it gonna be? Who's it gonna be? Oh, that, that jingle's brilliant. It really, really is. Oh, he's, he's just, in fact, speaking of him, our beautiful weirdo genius jingle man Jason did you see he had a he had a football sticker made up of Brogan I did see that yeah I think that's one of the ones that gets <laughs> given out as uh, man of the match things for the, the, the youngsters is it for the, like, oh, that's, uh, it's excellent I enjoyed it oh absolutely tremendous but if you've never heard this competition before or you're new to the podcast we have got a St Johnston X player mystery voice here's the clip hi I'm <laughs> and I'm the dog of saints mystery voice who could it be? If you want, if you think you know, come on, have a guess. I'd like, just like this guy did this week. We've got Kevin Heller. How you doing, buddy? Are you okay? I'm very well. Well, I was about to say very well, but not very well after that day. But hey, it, it could be worse. You could have been stuck in the house on day seven of COVID. Oh, well, actually, that might have been a, maybe a, a better. Yeah, that, that would have been a preferred option. I, I, know, I, felt, I, I felt jealousy in that for a bit. So. <laughs> did you have a fun day out yesterday, Kev? Bar the result? Um... It was a nice thing song. Nice thing song. <laughs> Little things turned ugly at the end. Yes. Um, yeah, well, that's that's one of the very few positives we can take out of that one yesterday. But ugh, well, it could turn around. It might not. We will find out. Time will tell. But more pressing matters await this. Hi. I'm... <laughs> and I'm the Dog of Saints mystery voice. It's been running for up to three weeks now, I think, this competition. But... As we, as we discussed just before you came on, Kev, the Bournemouth dog poo bag holder is on its way. It has been dispatched finally, and we'll also be adding the Strawberry Ferguson vape oil. So if you know any vapists or anybody with a dog, you have got some ready-made gifts for them. Two dogs, so can't wait. Oh, <laughs> I know it's not Tranmere, but Bournemouth will be just as uh, useful. Just, It'll do the trick, I'm sure. Who do you think the mystery voice is, Kev? I think it is Philip Fizzy Scott. Well... He has not been suggested. Name so far, we have had... It's not Steve Brown. That was our suggestion last week when we couldn't get a guest on. It is not Mark Trainer. Oh, do we have, do we have not Mark Trainer? No, it was no. Um, Dougie Barron. Oh, I've just given you a freebie. It's not Mark Trainer, And it is not Roddy Grant. Roddy Grant. Right. That's the first one. But you've also got a freebie who it's not. It's not Mark Trainer. But is it Philip Fizzy Scott? Let's find out. <laughs> oh, wrong button. Sorry, I was getting your, your hopes up there. But it might be... <laughs> It's not. It is not Philip Fizzy Scott. How did you get to that suggestion? It, as soon as I heard it, it was, it was Philip Scott in my mind. And then I listened to your podcast interview and then started out myself. But I thought maybe you recorded it on a different device and sounded different. But oh well. <laughs> By all means, feel free to come back for another guest. But um, it is not Philip Fizzy Scott. And we will give a clue after this. I think, will we give a clue, Dan? Yeah, we might as well. We will give a clue. Why not? Uh, but Kev, very much appreciate you coming on. Thanks for listening to the podcast, as always. Very much appreciated. Thank you, guys. Keep up the good work. Good man, Kev. We'll see you at McDermott right, again. Kev. We'll see you on Wednesday. See you there. Take care, mate. Morning. Cheers, buddy. Bye-bye. Can't wait. Oh, Kev, nice guy. But incorrect, it was not Philip Fizzy Scott. Close, but no cigar. A cigar remains in that nice tube you get. Indeed it is. But we did say that we'd give you a clue. Should we, should we, we'll give people a clue, won't we? Let, let's push this on a bit. Yeah, go on. Let's let's push things forward. The streets. The very man. Uh, his his new single's out. It's really, really bad. His last album as well uh, is really, really bad. 
it, yeah, I think there was very much a time and a place for the streets, and that was sort of exclusive between 2002 and 2006. Yeah, not not so much anymore. Like all the songs sound really outdated. Like that one about uh, when you wasn't famous, talking about everybody having camera phones. <laughs> well, that's not aged very well. Well, I, I suppose it's still relevant. I suppose baby does have a camera phone. Anyway, the clue we will give this week because we know a lot of people guess from listening through our old guests to think if it's one of these voices because they think it must be someone we've already spoken to. This week's clue is this person, our mystery voice, or Wendy Who, has never been a guest on the podcast. Oof, that's quite a big clue, isn't it? How is it down a bit? It does. It takes 50 odd Saints players out of action. Yeah, but you've got to remember, you've got to marry up the clues. Well, this is true. But there, our clue last week was actually, I'm not going to tell you last week's clue. Listen to the podcast and listen to Mark McCulloch as well because he was brilliant. <laughs> Do your own research. We can only we can only help you so much. Exactly that. But let's go on to more pressing matters. The current form. Do we have to? Do we have to? Please. Uh, let's talk about Kelty very very quickly, shall we? <laughs> do I have to? Can I just can we not just do a review of last season just to make everyone feel better? <laughs> yeah, we won two cups, but um, <laughs> no, not ideal weekend. Uh, going out to a, a, to be fair, a team who thoroughly deserved the victory. Regardless of the we got, So, yeah, we got everything that we deserved out of that game of football and so did they. They didn't actually... This is the bizarre thing about it. Second half particularly, they didn't actually play particularly well. I thought they played well enough in the first half and then in extra time, I thought they were actually very, very good. But um, And we still... But second half... They didn't play particularly well and still totally outplayed, doesn't deserve the victory. It was, I think, all through this run. Remember the Simpsons episode where um, where Homer and Bart are chasing, are chasing the pig? Like Lisa's sort of um, pushed Homer's barbecue with a pig on it and he's like just going through Springfield. And then... But then Homer's like, it's just a little wet. It's still good. It's still good. It's just a little airborne. It's still good. It's still good. It's gone bad. I and know. That was that was sort of Saturday was um, it's just a little airborne because all through this run, I've been like, it's fine. We'll turn it around. It's just a run. We'll turn it around. And then sort of week by week, I'm like, this is getting a little bit more serious. This is getting worse. Saturday, you know what? The only good thing about Saturday, the only good thing, I cannot possibly see a way it gets any worse whatsoever. It was bilge. Rock, Absolute bilge. Rock bottom has been hit. Yeah, it was rock bottom. And look, there's no disrespect to Kelsey because, as I said earlier, the fourth division, but they're not. They, they're going to, I mean, they're going to go up this season. Could very easily see them being a championship side in the not too distant future. Um, within the next couple of seasons, probably. They, and, you know, good manager, in my opinion, Kevin Thompson's doing a really good job there. Some good players. The simple fact of the matter was, on Saturday... I hate saying this, but they wanted it more. Yep. They wanted it more. And it's, it was as simple as that. They got one really good chance. And well, they had a couple of half decent chances, but so did we. They got one really good chance, another mistake from Gallagher, who I'm going to, because it was his debut, I'm going to give him a little bit of a pass also because nobody was tracking Higginbottom's run. Um, I know it's come off a set piece, but you've got three centre halves there you'd think one of them could have either stayed in or got back. Uh, Higginbottom had all the time in the world when he got in the box. Xander actually did pretty well to hold him up for as long as he did, but it was just, he had just had time to pick his spot, finished it really well. And from then on, for the next probably 20 minutes that were left of the game, that was sort of by my reckoning. It was about 20 minutes left. <laughs> they just totally controlled the ball, controlled the game, um, dictated the pace of the game, protected the lead brilliantly, but could have gone two up. They had a, it was a wonderful effort. It was a um, centre forward, a 
Fortunately, can't remember his name and I've not looked it up in advance, which is my fault. But a uh, really good player, actually. Had a, he had a terrific effort that just that clattered the crossbar. And, yeah, it looked for all the world like it was more likely for them to go 2 and up than for us to equalise. And, um, yeah, and then obviously that led to, led to the scenes at the end, which were... Unsavory. No matter what... Pe- well, no matter what people's view on them was, and I think it was unsavoury, um, but the the fact that it was even allowed to happen was a little bit of a farce. Yeah, it's kind of having a team of any team win or lose walk through the fans at the end, but fair play to a few of the boys who managed to get them off the pitch. Can't really blame Xander for having a wee pop back if somebody was said to him that was a bit personal. You, you know what? So I've got two... Two sort of points on this. One, there was enough stewards about. And I don't really blame Kelty. Kelty have got to work under the COVID regulations. They've got the facility next door, the school. And under normal circumstances, they won't have a crowd there big enough for it to matter. But they've got they've obviously paid for this extra stewarding for the game. There was plenty of them. And they're all stood there with a thumb up their ass. They could have made like a tunnel up that up the stairs. Up that set of stairs. They could have made a tunnel for the players. Um, there was one lad there who seemed to be like really a Saints fan who um, was sort of like giving players a pat on the back as he went off. And it was really funny because he fell over about three times on the slope. <laughs> if you watch the video, it's great. He couldn't get his foot in. Um, so, look, I was never... I'd gone by this point. I'd left about a minute before the final whistle. Partly because I was just like, well, we're not scoring. I'm getting out before they have to close that exit off for the players to get out. And also, um, I wanted, we we went to the off license and got some cans and I stand by that decision as opposed to watching in the last minute. Um, but, sorry, back to my original point. It, I, from the videos I saw, obviously you can't hear everything that was said and Xander will have reacted unless someone went over the line. My view on it is, people have, and I get everyone's view on it, I really do, but my own personal view is we're all adults. Someone has, you know, everyone's pissed off. If someone has a go, fair enough. But then someone has a go back like Xander did. Again, fair enough. Actually, good. Shows he's got a bit of sort of fight for it. But again, I don't know. I, but then again, I'm also thinking, oh, Liam did exactly the right thing, ushering the players off and, and sorting that. So... I don't think it was ever going to go... Some people said some of the comments went too far. As I say, I didn't pick that up on any of the videos that were doing the rounds. And I'd I'd gone by that point. So I don't know. And... um, I think... It was never going to... It was never going to turn physical, so... No. But I think out of all the people to have a pop at, Xander Clark probably shouldn't be one of them. Since he's probably been pretty flawless this season. Yeah, and I get that. And probably why... Probably one of the reasons why Xander took particular exception. I think at the same time, it was just anyone in a anyone with a St. Johnston badge on the chest was was in the firing line. And yeah, it look, it's it's I don't think it's the biggest issue. It's gonna it's become sort of the biggest talking point from Saturday. And I think that's probably the worst thing about it, because it really, really shouldn't be. No, certainly not. It was a poor result. People are saying maybe the worst in the club's history. I think that will probably die off, that kind of opinion. But I was, I think in context, looking at it on, on paper, we should be beating a team in League 2, the third tier of Scottish football. However, they're absolutely flying high and as good as a championship club. They are. But at the same time, that's a cup we're defending. Yeah. And it's not, I don't even think it's so much the defeat. Well, it is a defeat. But it was the performance, it was the... It just seems... I, I think it's probably unfair to say it. I was going to say there was a lack of fight, but I, I think the, the, they looked down. They looked down and down on the haunches, really, the players, and I think that's something we're going to explore later on because there's probably reasons for it. it there, probably, there, probably was a lack, there probably was a lack of fight because they've just got no fight to give. That's it. No confidence. Heads are down at the moment, but... As the podcast is a little bit in now, we're we're at a low. Shall we go back to a high? Let's do it. Let's 
Buckle up, baby. <laughs> we are, we're going to we're be up, in for the wild ride. <laughs> we're going to be up and down more times than a horse knickers, as they, as they say. Oh, well, did, did that it, was used to be... Um, when, I, when I went to the golf club back home in my younger days, I used to work behind the bar at the golf club. There was, um, there was obviously a, a flag there. I can't remember what it was like. The, um, the cross of St. George. And it was um, someone who was possibly with my dad actually definitely my, my dad because he used to lower it at half lower it to half mast every time some like a member joshed it and, and my dad said <laughs> that part was fucking hell that flags up and down more time than more times than a bride's night <laughs> the class the classic take on the phrase but let's move on let's move on we're out of the cup with a whimper which is a shame but we will move on to this it's Giorgio Boyle in the Royal where have you seen St. Johnson players what have they been doing like Grant Fairweather who sent us a message on Twitter this week he's seen somebody what were they doing Dan well it's a belter and I'm very grateful Grant nice fella um, for sending this in to us and well like I'm hoping from the preface of this that um, Grant's a chef because he says he wa- I once cooked for Jonathan Johansson at my work I'm hoping that he's not a joiner <laughs> and and JJ's just gone in for some timber and um, Grant's decided to you know get the walk out or something um, but <laughs> we, need, we need some context there Grant we need some context no I think it's a reasonable assumption that Grant's <laughs> a chef so he said he wants to cook for Jonathan Johansson at my work, um, Jonathan Johansson, former Saints player and um, husband of friend of the show, Gene Johansson. Oh, I love Gene Johansson. Ah, Gene's great. Loves kicking up shit with people. It's brilliant. <laughs> Michael anyway, Sarah especially. But anyway, we, we, we digress. Ah, that was top quality. Good on her. Uh, anyway, move on. Wait, none of the wait- <laughs> said none of the waiting staff knew it was him until I left to go home. So obviously, yeah. So I think the next part, the context of this is Grant's on his way home and he's caught a glimpse of JJ in the restaurant. I'm assuming it's a restaurant. <laughs> or, or, or timber merchant. Um, he's left to go home. Um, on his way, I says to his colleague, is that Johnston Johansson, ex-Rangers, St. Johnston and Hibs player? Well, only one of those clubs matters. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> speaking of hips, I've got to throw this in. Right. Do you remember? Um, do you remember episode one? Oh wow. Yes, because every time I'm listening to the latest episode, when it finishes, it goes straight back to episode one again, and me sounding like a robot. I hate that. Yeah, you sounding like a robot. Me sounding like I'm on the cludgy. <laughs> but um, during episode one, the Phantom Menace. We um it very we much went, it very much is the Phantom Menace of our if our, our, our <laughs> podcast for Star Wars movies. So yeah, so we've gone now we ripped into um this this hive. Essentially we we set our stall out for this podcast pretty early because we relentlessly mocked a child. Is this Alan? Yeah, little Alan, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who we we had to sort of reach out to a little bit afterwards, and basically to cover our bags for being the t- for being twats. Yeah, because we didn't think anybody would actually listen to the podcast, and when people did, we thought, oh, we we thought just our mates would listen, and then we just publicly mocked a small boy for sporting hips. We nasally yeah. bastard. Yeah, I mean, yeah, why not as well? Why not? Anyway. Speculate to that, even though he don't wear specs. Anyway, um, <laughs> he's just the epitome of spec. Anyway, he's um, back to the point. So, one of our sort of fan Twitter feeds, um, St. Johnston fans, really good Twitter feed, posts loads of great videos. And before the Kelty game, uh, put up the video of Rooney's goal from the cup final last year, Scottish Cup final, I should say, and Spoonie sending Dogic into the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> Um, and this was obviously before the game after the game there was one comment from and it was from Hibbs Allen and it just simply read lol 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> get yourself in there, Alan. It's been waiting a whole year and you have done us up like an absolute kipper. Well done, boy. We should do a new section called Wanker Fans, where we just take opposing fans, just noise up merchants. There's a wee guy uh, for Partick Thistle, can't remember what his name is, like Manpreet or something. He's always having a dig against St. Johnson for absolutely no reason. I don't know what he's got against us. Hearts fans really fucking hate us as well. Yeah. As I discovered on Tuesday night. Also, by the way, I'm going to get Grant back to Grant's story in a second here. But if you're the person who launched a pie straight out of the away end at Tyne Castle and hit someone in the home end square in the chest, <laughs> if you could, if you could get in contact with me, and if you want to spend your entire summer stood on a cricket boundary, <laughs> I feel I could use your arm to great effect. <laughs> it was nailed. Good job. Anyway, <laughs> right. But that leads us nicely on back to the catering, um, the catering capers of Grant and Jonathan Johansson. Episode, so, <laughs> episode name for the week. Yeah. So um, Grant goes on to say, he said, wanted to get a picture with him, but didn't. Didn't want to ask him while he was out for dinner. And that is very wholesome. I, I like that from Grant. But my wholesome uh, people with dinner, my mate Jamie, remember the guys whose house I was at, uh, the Dundee fan is is downstairs lavy. It was like a, a room full of nightmares. Yeah. Ugh, horrible. He, I can't remember, he went to Dubai for his honeymoon and he was sitting at a table next to AJ, Anthony Joshua. And he was looking over and he, 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 got, he kind of pulled his phone out and Anthony Joshua went, come over a second. So he came over and said, pull up a chair you and your wife, so they sat down and had a blether about boxing. He said, sorry, I didn't want you to take a selfie because I just wanted to, uh, didn't want to draw attention to myself. So they sat and ch- chatted about boxing. The wife talked about their kids and then uh, they got a wee sneaky photo at the end and off he went. So that was nice. He invited him over to his table. What a guy, that is wholesome. That is very wholesome behaviour. Well done from the champ. You won't catch Tyson Fury doing that. Certainly not. But if, if he probably didn't tell me he was a Dundee fan, that would have been a whole different story. Yeah, yeah, that would have been a whole different story. However, we have to also remember the salient point of this. JJ, better than AJ. There is. <laughs> and therefore, Grant's wholesome story, it takes the cake. A very fine story and a great spot. If you want to get back in touch with us and let us know some context, uh, we'll let the listeners know next week. But if you have seen a St. Johnson player out and about, where have they been doing? Where have they been? Let us know with some context as well. It would be very helpful. But if you need some suggestions about who you might have seen, I know a man. He's sitting opposite me. It's Danny Williams. Sam, listeners, I got to tell you, I enjoy nothing more in life than hearing where you've seen the Saints. It really, it fills my heart with the joy un- untold. But I think, I think you've seen all these Saints. I know you have. I know this. I know you've got stories bursting at the seams for us. But you might just need a little bit of encouragement to get the stories out, to know what you're looking for. Because I'm aching to know, I'm yearning to know, I've got to know. I'm absolutely fantasizing oh, about oh. where you've seen these saints. And I've got to know, I'm aching to know, I'm yearning to know. And I think, but I think I'm going to give you a couple of examples just to whet the appetite, just to get the juices flowing for you in, our, in your noble quest to dig out your stories, to dig out your souls. Anyway, and then you come to me, you sing to me, you come and let the boys know. And I'll tell you, I'll let us know in a minute, but I'm going to give you a couple of examples first before I let you know, because you can't let us know unless you know what we're looking for. So if you've ever seen Saints centre forward, Nadia Chifty, yeah, I'm being nice to a present member of the squad because he's new. Have you ever seen Nadia Chifty, the Turkish Dennis Law, living at large in the snooker room at a Warner Leisure Hotel before things get heated over a contentious touching ball called by his elderly opponent and he's asked to leave the premises? <laughs> It could have happened. It could have happened. It could have happened. Old, 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 old Albert from Shropshire is still removing the snooker cue from his records. Anyway, we move on. And I might need to give you another example. I need to give you a second example because then you got, because one's just not enough. <laughs> so have you ever seen 90s mainstay Darren Dodds heading down to Liverpool to torch the childhood home of now deceased funster Ken Dodd in <laughs> revenge for a case of mistaken identity? Which actually turned out to be a really convincing dream Darren had. <laughs> well, now ser- he's now serving ten years in he's now serving ten years in Berlin. <laughs> but if you've ever seen that, 
I think you've seen it. I've loved to know. I've got to know. I'm aching. I'm yearning to know. You come and let the boys know by all the usual social streams. Dog Saints on Twitter. Dog Saints on Instagram. Dog Saints.com, the t- contact section. And the old facey B. Stop commenting on posts on the Lucy Pinder fan page. <laughs> Everyone can see what you're doing. And she's old news. <laughs> she is old news. Favorite thing about the internet is on Twitter is seeing like random set of women with tits. And then it says somebody who you follow likes this and it just appears in your feed. You know who you are. Oh, no. I know who they are. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's absolutely great seeds. It's <laughs> tremendous seeds. So anyway, but you'd stop doing that. And you come and let the boys know. You come and let us know where you've seen the cities. You got to let us know. We all need a bit of cheering up at the minute. Ooh, get there. <laughs> Ah, from the highs of Lucy Pinder to the lows of Steve Brown. Is he one of the reasons we are in the situation we are in just now? Is he doing the right thing? Is he splashing the cash as promised? Has he done well in the transfer market to help and support his manager? Let's find out. Danny, what's your opinion on Steve Brown? Is he the reason we are in this position? Well, I'm going to preface this by saying that I don't think there's any one single reason or single individual that we can pin the current malaise onto, but... What you invariably find in an organisation that's underperforming is that it tends to start from the top. And yeah, I, I, what I'm going to what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually say a few positives here before we learn, before we get into where he's going wrong. Because actually, in terms of at the minute in January, I don't I'm not sure how much more he could do. And I'm going to sort of have faith that the money that we got from Kerr and McCann, and we'll come on to that in a minute, <laughs> money that was there from Kerr and McCann and the cup wins and the European ties and, and everything associated with that was is probably being better served in the summer. Because January is not a great time to do business. I genuinely believe that. And you've just got to do what you can at the minute. And I, I do sort of see that happening. Um, sort of like Chifchi. I don't think he's a player that would have come in in the summer. No. But in January, when we're looking for just something... Then yeah, so I'm, that's one. So that's my one thing out of the way, and then the obvious of we can't really complain about our Saints run when we look at Dunfermline and Dundee, who both very nearly weren't clubs anymore. Motherwell, Hearts, all got into administration. That's similar clubs, and they've done it financial mismanagement and not accounting for a rainy day. Absolutely right. And as we are recording at the moment, our last two signings have both been signed for an undisclosed fee which means money has been put forward, which hasn't been done by St. Johnson under Steve Brown's tenure at all, if I'm, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think we've spent money on a player. McCart, I think. We brought McCart in for cash. I beg your pardon then, but it's not... Again, 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 that was a similar situation to McPherson in that I think we signed him on a pre-contract and then a bit of money became available. And, you know, it's, it tends to happen with these things. We've seen it a lot this window uh, across the across the cinch that <laughs> um, sort of clubs are... The players are signing pre-contact agreements, but basically it's just a placeholder until the money comes in. Money has been spent. He is spending money now. He is. He is. And it's this undisclosed fee. We don't really know how much is there, how much has been sort of changed hands with Sligo Rovers for the services of John Mahon. Um, I think that's how you put it. Mahon. I, I have no idea. Um, I should have rung, should have rung Liam Doris up before, and they'll know. Um, <laughs> he'll need to know. Um, and uh, Cammy McPherson as well. So, yeah, it's being spent. I think there's plenty more there, um, even if it is just the Kerr and McCann money. Again, we'll come on to that now. Um, so, yeah, so that's the good things. That's the good things there. You have to go back to last summer, and it's not just Kerr and McCann. You have to go back to last summer for Steve Brown's sort of part in all of this, because... St. Johnston were a very attractive proposition for a player last summer. Maybe not for ones that were already there, sort of the two that left, and probably another couple that <clears throat> maybe had their heads turned a little bit. Jimmy McCarr. Um, um, not mention any names, but <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so you're looking at it, and I think there was a massive missed opportunity, a massive missed opportunity to strike while the iron was hot. And I know it's a delicate balance, anyone could see that Kerr and McCann were going. Neither were going. Everyone had accepted it. 
And in the end, I think we were pretty grateful it was only the two of them. I just think they need, would have known the money was coming in. There would have been money there and, and anyway through other means. Why was there not more done to, to kick on from the platform that was set? We spoke to David Wolverspoon at the end of last season and he's talking, Spoonie's talking about going for third and, you know, going for European places again, another European run next season. I think most people would generally think along those lines. We won the two cups. We had this brilliant, exciting young manager. We had a lot of good players. Then was the chance to strengthen, and and we didn't. And we just now kind of, we're sort of sorry. We just kind of rested on our laurels a little bit. I think there was a little bit of resting on laurels. The Curry McCann situation was very difficult, and this is the big obvious thing. I actually think it was very difficult because it was you had to balance Europe with that. And don't forget, we give ourselves a bloody good chance in Europe. It seems unbelievable now that it was only this season that we were level in ties with Galatasaray and Lask with 20 minutes to go in each tie. Mm-hmm. It is over 180 minutes. That is, it's just bizarre to think about that now. But we, we were. Um, so, and I think the players as well, those two players probably would have hung about if we'd got into the group stages of either the Europa League or the, the Conference League. So there was that, but there was no there was no planning in place. And it was obvious that once a bid had come in, no matter what that bid was, no matter how we were undersold on either of them, they were going to go. Well, the chairman, there is some positives there, but obviously you did pull up the negatives on that as well. He is part of the blame, but we'll get to the manager and the player in due course. But... Uh, this day and age, it's all about being eco-friendly, Dan. You've got to do it, Sam. We've all <laughs> got to play our part. I mean, you do get a little bit pissed off when you're, you know, washing a Passata box out <laughs> to take to the recycling bin and there's empty planes circling about so they don't lose their um, the runway slots, you know. That, that, that makes it all feel <laughs> worthwhile, but there we go. It does indeed, but let's move on from Steve Brown to the Club Shop of Shame. <laughs> What's the shop? Club shop of shame. What's the shop? Club shop of shame. What's the shop? Club shop of shame. What's the shop? Shame. Yeah, the reason I was talking about eco-friendly products, you were thinking, what the fuck is he talking about? Um, this is all to do with our Club Shop of Shame entry this week. The last couple of weeks, we have gone pretty balls deep on in Rangers, uh, discussing a £800 gold signet ring and a £1.99 vape oil called Strawberry Ferguson. Ridiculous. Oh, that might be my favourite thing we've ever had. I've come to, I've thought about it a lot, and it, it's uh, it, it's certainly up there. It's it's absolutely dreadful. But uh, we did get a couple of messages sent in to say that Celtic also did vape oils uh, with stupid names, but they were nowhere near as stupid as Strawberry Ferguson. Nah, the one it was, yeah, Watermelon Winger was one that stuck in my mind. You, nah, like top corner tobacco or something. It was just no use. But don't think you've got away with it this week, Celtic. We are putting you under the spotlight and your eco-friendly attempt at a product, which is absolutely diabolical. Daniel. And it's eco-friendly. It says so in the title. (laughs) I need to tell you this. I mean, a lot of people like myself over the last couple of years we have been working from home and, you know, needing to find sort of different solutions and different ways of working. You might have limited space. And all that, you might be like me, who sits at a breakfast bar on a backless chair. Or a stool, if you will. With your bad back, that can't do you any favours. I, I, I'm in constant agony. <laughs> anyway, my, my, life, my life is just one sort of big strain of misery. Anyway, <laughs> we, move, we move on. <laughs> we move on. This is supposed um, to be the cheaty section, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not a sort of constant string of misery. I just have a bad back. Anyway, um, so we move. <laughs> so we move on. Anyway, um, so yeah, we, we we're all having to find different space and and all that, and we're all trying to be eco friendly. So if you want to, if you're working from home, and you're trying to be eco friendly, <laughs> and you support Celtic, may I introduce you, listeners? To the Celtic eco-friendly cardboard home desk. <laughs> it's a cardboard box. It's a fucking box. <laughs> they have painted. Oh, painted. Yeah, I'm going to say painted. It was all not paint, but it's painted in green and white stripes. With a freaking whacking great big Celtic badge on it. 
It's basically a cardboard box that they're selling as a home desk. I mean, wow, what a hustle. What an absolute hustle. The description will surely tell us more about this, this horror show. Yes. Well, here we go. Now, <laughs> I have a description. Complies with DAC health and safety regulations. Spacious 980 times 500 millimeter working area. 740 millimeter working height. Max load, 20 kilogram. Do not stand on the desk. <laughs> no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> and no naked flames on the desk. Again, I, I mean, I could have worked that one out for myself. Um, not to, you know, take your lighter to, to a box. Um, anyway, <laughs> that's it. That's your description. Oh, that just I, I, tells you what not to do with the box. Yes, pretty much. Um, which actually seems like a sort of reasonable thing to do. I think Celtic are well aware that they're, they're selling a, an absolute heap here because, <laughs> yeah, it's more just instructions on what not to do. There's there's certain things we like to do with products. One of them is obviously tell you all about the product. Then we like to go to the description. Then we like to go to reviews, which which we tend to do now. Our best review came last week on the Rangers um, e-cigarette oil liquid thing, uh, which basically read, simply the best, better than all the rest. Amazing. <laughs> now, now <laughs> right. so now what I'm hoping for is on this reviews, um, what could we have? I just can't get enough of this eco-friendly cardboard home desk. Why have they not called that cardboard that. cardboard bahox? B H O X. Get there, Miller. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Funny. It's only taken 49 episodes. <laughs> I will lap this up. That's the funniest thing you've ever said. Thanks, man. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's probably not, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> right. Anyway, anyway, let's see what the uh, let's see what the people of the Parkhead area have got to have got to say about this. We heard from we heard from Govan last <laughs> week, so let's see if from the Parkhead bunch. What have they got here? Right. Reviews. No reviews. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh dear. And I mean. <laughs> This makes me think that because of what the sort of old firm supporters are like, and they are very partisan on every single aspect of the club. I mean, for example, we had someone commenting last week, in fact, two people commenting on vape oil last week and reviewing that. So I would have expected something here. Uh, I don't know what, what Celtic from. Oh, this is a famous, oh, this is the most famous day. It took me all the way back to Lisbon and all that. Um, we did Lisbon. We did, we did Benfica, did we not? We did an office chair, Benfica office chair. You could sit at the Benfica office chair at your Celtic desk and reel of 67. And when you were born in 1988. <laughs> take you all the way back there. So, anyway. So we've, um, got, so we've got no description. We've yeah. got we've got no reviews. Have no, we, uh, we, no. We've got no pr- reviews, no description. Have we got a price? Oh, you better believe we've got a price, boy. <laughs> so bear in mind, despite the fact we didn't really have a description, we have described this to you. It's it's a box on acid, right? <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fuck me. Right. Um, if you. <laughs> So, Sam, listeners, if you would like the Celtic eco-friendly cardboard home desk, you can have this for £49.99. pence. Yeah, fuck Celtic. It's a, fucking, it's a box. It's a, it is a it's box. It's a box. Mad boys, a box. A box. <laughs> Instead of going to the box factory, we're going to the box factory. Terrible. That, that, there's not Don't much wait. more we can say about this. It's a, a box freelancing as a home desk do not stand on do not get wet for 50 quid celtic you're but people will buy it because there's a big as you say a big massive celtic badge in it there's actually two big celtic badges on it so I imagine that double sales it's prob- that's probably out of price and it's 25 quid a badge um anyway <laughs> yeah i mean i'm i'm just looking at 20, I mean, 20 kilogram 20 kilogram maximum sort of weight on it I, you wouldn't be able to put a lot of stuff on that no. like your laptop and a brew and then when and then if you spilt your brew you know the desk. You're up, you're up the creek without the proverbial. The the integrity of the home desk would be certainly compromised somewhat. Oh, you better believe it, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you better believe it. But the thing is, so Dan, I will never have to worry because I will never be buying an eco-friendly Celtic cardboard home desk. Ram it. 
Yeah, well and truly ram it out. Yeah, no, just shameless. Absolutely shameless. But let's move on. If you've seen anything on a club website that might need to come under the scrutiny of me and Dan, you have to let us know. But you might need another example. This one, maybe a little bit more fictional, comes from the mind of Danny Williams, so it's going to be a little bit obscure. But he's going to give you a suggestion, and here it is. Danny. Well, you say this, Sam, but I think it's a, we've covered one like really big real-world issue um, in this section already with climate change and the, the climate crisis. But we've got, a, we've got another one. We've got another thing that's hung over all of us for two years now, uh, and that's public health. So I'd, I'd actually like to be serious. I, I, I think I'm going to use this opportunity this week. I, I know I can be a bit out there with these examples. I know I can be a bit, but I really want to be serious this week because I think even as we move into the post-COVID world, I think public health has got to be such a big issue. And I, I really think we need to, everyone needs to do the bit. And especially, I think football clubs in communities can can have such a big impact I'm actually, I'm going to think about our opponents from Saturday, Sam, and the impact they can have. Kelty Hearts, you know, in a small community like Kelty, a football club, particularly one on the rise like Kelty, can can play such a such a big role. And I thought of a public health initiative that I think Kelty have, you know, got on board with. I, I really think this is this is out there. So that's right, listeners. Have you ever seen a community public health pamphlet for the Kelty area endorsed by Kelty Hearts Football Club? Entitled, So You've Decided to Bone Your Sister. <laughs> and please come and let the boys know. Don't, don't. Be, but I'm just making it because from what I could ascertain on Saturday, it's a real pandemic in, in Kelsey. So, yeah. You should have got for Kelty Hart's six-fingered gloves. I don't want to be encouraging it, Sam. <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm about prevention rather than rather than short-term fixes like <laughs> gloves. So, yeah, that's what I'm going to go for. <laughs> the Kelty Hearts Community Health Pamphlet. So you've decided to bone your sister. I'd rather be a lifer than a fifer, <laughs> as they say. I think, I, think, I think we can fix the problem, and I think Kelty Hearts have got a big role to play. And if you've seen it? If you have seen... This handy compendium of advice for these sister fiddling freaks. <laughs> then you come and let the boys know, and I'm going to tell you how to let us know. You got to let us know. You got to know. Needs to know. Making them. Yeah, maybe not in this particular case, but in other in other examples, in <laughs> real tap football clubs are selling. I'm making them. Yeah, need to know what's going down in the wonderful world of the tap and the football. So if you come and let us know, you come and let us know, I've got to tell you, I'll let the boys know. You come and let the boys know by all the usual social streams. Doug Saints on Instagram, Doug Saints on Twitter, DougAsaints.com, the contact section, and the old facey B. Please, stop longing for the return of Farmville. <laughs> oh. It's gone. It was a pain in the arse, and it's gone. It Trev, your sheep are never coming back, son. It was the word love its day. It was the word love. I've given up on that. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I haven't done it in days and I've lost the habit after about five days of it I've, I've given up which was the absolute inevitability of it but yeah Farmville not coming back but you know he's here to stay you old pal Sam and Dan so you come and let us know you come and let the handsome boys know and we'll get you we'll get your suggestions out there Woo! get there the lovely stuff let's move on shall we before <laughs> let's please move on Sister fiddling freaks, Daniel. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get what's it. I'm just going to... Everyone's going to hate me by the end of this. Tell you who doesn't hate you, Stuart Cosgrove. You, you made an appearance on Off the Ball this at, uh, on Sunday, I should say. Beg your pardon. <laughs> I did, yeah. It was good, that. Yeah. Um, oh, good laugh. Our, our mate Stuart, he uh, gives a shout. I try to get the, get the two Dannys, uh, some sort of rehash of the two Dannys, which I think was a play on the two Ronnies. Um... It would have been, yeah, Danny, he might have said it, with Danny Kelly and Danny Baker. So he's trying to get me and um, me and Daniel Gray, who does the Nutmeg Football Magazine, absolutely brilliant read of you, if you get the chance to do to get hold of it. Um, but he's on a couple of podcasts, isn't he, as well, Sam? Yeah, he does when Saturday comes podcast as well. So um, if you don't need to hear the clip, here it is. Because one of the top St. Johnson podcast, you've always laughed at it before, the Dogger well, the Doggers Saint, one, eh? aye, the Dogger Saints podcast. The guy, one of the two guys that hosts it, Daniel Williams, 
is an English guy who came up to, to Perth, fell in love with Saints, and now goes home and away everywhere. And the two Dannys, remember there was the two Dannys down in London? The two Dannys in aye, London? Danny Kelly and Danny oh, Baker. Oh, Danny Baker, right. Aye, aye yeah. the two Dannys. I think a Scottish version of that with our today's guest, Daniel Gray and Danny Williams of the Dogger podcast. Dogger boys could set this up in the next yeah. few weeks. Two English guys that have Great. fallen in love with Scottish the two football. two Dannys. Well, uh, if we can have 28 years of the two fannies. <laughs> 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 Why not? Why not? All, all work gratefully accepted, Stuart. Thanks very Indeed. much. So, <laughs> Danny Williams and, and uh, Sam, if you're listening, great idea for the show, the two Dannys, and it's two English guys and why they fell in love with Scottish football, one a hippie and one a sainty. Great. Yeah, so, yes, the two Fannies, I think that's very apt, I feel. I'm convinced we should change the name of this podcast to the two Fannies. Well, somebody would inevitably say, you know, Fanny means vagina, don't you? Like we get oh, no, every yeah. other week with the dogger thing. Uh, do, you know, do you know what dogger means? No, mate. I live in a cave with my fingers in my ears. <laughs> Not in a car with your fingers up your <laughs> up your hee-haw. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be ironic. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, so, so Dan, Dan Gray, if you're listening, uh, and you, for some reason you want to get involved in this. <laughs> Not the dogging aspect, um, the, the, the spin-off. Yeah, yeah maybe, next, well, maybe next time we play Hibs, Dan, if you're up for it, come on, you come on and have a chat with us. Tell you who's not a Hibs fan, Callum Davidson. <laughs> what a weak link, but we'll move on. We're going to talk, we're going to play the blame game. We've had a look at Steve Brown. We are going to touch on Callum Davidson for a few minutes to see what his role in this whole downturn of form is. The manager, obviously, is the, the main focal point of any team when things aren't going well. Dan, what's your opinion? Yeah, um, I'm just going to sort of going to very quickly go back to something. Not only was I on... Um, not only did I make it onto off the ball, I also made it into the um, Old Firm Facts Weekly Pat Roundup. Oh, you did? About calling the guy a spicky twat. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah about that. Um, so that's both of us been in that. So, yeah, me and... Um, it was actually funnier. Ross is on our list. as Ross and Aaron's replies to it um, because Ross spewed up that himself. Oh, good job. Which was... Which was really, <laughs> um, so we all made it on. So that was a good laugh. Anyway, what isn't a good laugh is um, the very... I'm going to call it a sad situation that's that's come about with with Callum Davidson. And who who would have ever, even like three months ago, thought that this had happened? Um, I don't think it. I think it goes back further. This sort of ten game losing streak. I don't actually think we've been very good all season, but we're getting we're getting results. Well, we're getting enough results to keep the wolves from the door. Not, yeah, to not be worried. Um, we're getting enough results to not be worried sort of earlier on in the season, but you put simply, put very simply, you don't lose 10 games on the spin and not have questions asked about you, no matter what club you're at. Have you got any positives? I, th- I had to think about um, this and I struggled. No. Um, well, the, again, for positives, and this isn't going to go down well with anyone, I've got to go back to last season because he is still the manager that was capable of winning the double, but football is fucking brutal. Mm-hmm. And... What you've done in the past very seldom matters. I'm actually going to very quickly go through some of this. Um, two biggest, probably actually since Alex Ferguson left Aberdeen, the two biggest shocks in British football, to my mind. The two, I mean, there's been loads of great achievements in like, so, you know, now I'd win in a treble, Arsenal going a season unbeaten, um, probably a couple of things Celtic and Rangers have done that I don't really want to talk about. Um, but the two that sort of stand out are like, how the hell did they do that? Where Leicester winning the league and St Johnston, um, St Johnston winning the cup double last season. Agreed. And and I look back at Leicester. I look at that, and I'm just parallels are sort of startling. Leicester got rid of Ranieri, and I'm not saying I want this to happen. I'm just saying if Leicester hadn't got rid of Ranieri when they did, because they were in free fall, they were on a horrendous losing streak. They'd have gone down, and it genuinely did get to the case where Craig Shakespeare took over. I mean, Jesus Christ, but even he could get a tune out of them, and it's just. He's got to break this rut pretty quickly. Otherwise, it is in a situation where it genuinely becomes just a change works. A change gives you more of a chance. And I don't want that to happen. But it's a case of you then weighing up in your mind. You, I think someone put it brilliant. Forgive me, I can't remember who it was. Said, your heart's saying a different thing to your head. And I think that is a little bit of the situation we're in at a minute. Um, but I do, for Callum's part... I really think there's things that he can do to give himself a chance. And 
stop being such stubborn old goat. The formation. When it comes to the formation, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's That could be his downfall and it's his own doing. Everybody's been able to see it since probably October, November, when even we were picking up results, the formation was not working, but he's sticking with it and he's continuing to stick with it. And it's like banging your head off a wall with it. Admit, nobody would be upset if he changed it now, but we're not the manager. We're not. And this is the problem because I'm not saying go into 4 4 2 or 4. Nobody plays 4 4 2, but go 4 3 3 or 4 2 3 1 or whatever. Basically, go 4 in the back. I'm not saying that works. I'm not saying that is a guaranteed thing that's going to work. But at least then, if that does go tits up, he can say, well, look, I tried. He can. He can you can say that it's, but I am with you, and I think a lot of people are saying this. The formation that worked brilliantly last season, it worked so well, isn't working. And yeah, it's just something needs to change and <laughs> quickly. And I think he's got to give himself a chance of changing it. I think so, but he's given himself a chance. This is his first proper window. Um, since losing McCann and Kerr and he is making changes he's brought in what five or six boys now they need to bed in now is that going to be another excuse if we start kind of picking up a performance but not a result or is it purely results based now yeah I think um, I think that's it mate and I think you've got to look at it. it this is why January is such a rubbish time to make wholesale changes and why it is such a gamble and why you probably do need to go for players like Chifchi who are just going to sort of immediately you'd hope immediately do something and magic your way out of it. Um, and Callum said that himself. He can't, he needs to have players that are immediately ready to bed in. Um, so he's not going to buy any strikers then? Well, well, exactly. That's another thing. And I just think you look at it now. He's also, I mean, he's got an excuse in a way, like you say, that he can then say, oh, well, the players needed time to, to bed in and all that. But also, he's no excuse in another sense, because this is his, this is his window. These are players that he's bought in. Mm. These are the players that he's decided on. And I know there's other people involved, but ultimately he's the one who gets the final say. And this is his, this is his, um, his team now, basically. There's very few remnants of what Tommy had. It's, it's down to him. And well, I, 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 want nothing more, absolutely nothing more than for this to to turn around under Callum and for us all to be looking back and saying, we're actually, we were, we were acting like a bunch of twats for those couple of months, weren't we, when we were doubting him. But it, you've got, we've just got to see it on the pitch and soon, otherwise we're in, we're in bother. Absolutely right. Time will tell whether the new guy's coming in and if Callum does change the formation or he does manage to magically, magically make this formation click. We'll talk about the players and their responsibility in all this very soon, but I think we should talk to a former player, an ex Kelty and St. Johnston player nonetheless. He's, a, he's getting his cake and eating it this weekend. But yes, we are speaking to Thomas Scobie this week, former St. Johnston, Falkirk, Dundee United briefly, Kelty, currently at Berwick Rangers. A massive part in our European run from 2012 to 2017, including that magical night at home to Lucerne where he scored the winning penalty. We'll talk to him about that. We'll apologise, we've already spoke to him and the audio is a little bit muffled from his side. Um, he was trying to keep his voice down he's of the newborn in the house, but it was a great chat nonetheless. So, without further ado, let's welcome on Tam Scobie. How are you doing, bud? Yeah, good. Thanks for inviting me on, man. Nope, thank you very much for, uh, for having us. Although you weren't a part of the Scottish Cup final squad, you were part of the... Uh, team, sorry, we were part of the squad at the time, so we can tick you off the bucket list of along with who we had James Dunn, Chris Miller, Fraser um, Wright, Fraser, Ando. All uh, right, we'll, we'll get yeah, Ando. Good. <laughs> so, do you know what? Ando was actually surprisingly good fun, a very, very dry <laughs> sense of humor, to be fair. But he was actually, we, we thought we'd struggle a bit with Ando, but he was all right, he was he was good fun. I saw him yesterday, he's got his arm in a sling. I was talking to him at half time. Was he? Oh, yeah. okay, uh, he's, um, he said it was playing, but I didn't hear anything about it. He's so I assume he's done it, you know, around the house or something. He's fallen over and done his uh, done his elbow. <laughs> let's let's talk about you, Thomas. Um, you went through the Falkirk youth system, obviously with the likes of like players like Scott Arfield, Liam Craig, 
And then the move, well, a chance for you to move to St. Johnston happen. How did that come about? Um, well, basically, I was in the last year of my contract. Um, I've got I've been delegated to the championship. Um, and I was trying to kind of cut the wage bill a wee bit. Just kind of agreed that it was for the right time to part away. So uh, come the end of the season, there's a few options on the table. And St. Johnston was the one that appealed to me most. I mean, I remember going to the stadium. It was actually... It was actually a clear but showing around the stadium and stuff like that. So just spoke to Lomas at the time, uh, came across really well. And I thought, you know, this would be a good move for me. I've done really, really well the previous season under Lomas. So I just thought, you know, the time was right for me to make the step back up to the So uh, Johnson were the ones that picked for the boxy. How was it? Uh, how long before Lomas left and Tommy Wright came in were you in the club for? Was it pretty? Was he there for the full I, season? Um, I think, I think I've done. Did, did Homer do the full? Then I moved. Did he do the full season? Then go down to Millwall. Millwall, I, I think he did one season. I, I think that was that was all he had yeah. in his locker. Yeah. That was actually going to go on loan at the time because I never really played much under Steve. And um, I remember, I remember one of my first games under him. He played me, at, uh, he played me at Park and I think I gave away a goal within like the first <laughs> four seconds of the game. <laughs> Good um, and I just went over and I saw him. Saw, I saw him telling Callum Davidson he had warmed up. And then to be fair, I never really kicked the ball for a good few weeks after that. But I was kind of in and out, and then I was going to go on loan because I didn't see myself playing much under Steve. Um, but then, as you say, Steve left and Tommy came in and one of his first phone calls was to me and said, I want to be part of the team and I'm going to play. And this and that, and just made me feel like he wanted me to be the club playing. Yeah. But I, that, that defence at the time, though, like it was probably still the best defence Saints have had ever, like with the likes of Dave Mackay, who everybody says it was probably one of the best players to play of the cl- uh, club, never to be capped by Scotland. I saw the out of 10 every week. You had Ando, you had Fraser Wright, uh, so Brian Easton and all these guys. So it was always going to be a, a tricky kind of back four to kind of break into. Uh, Michael Jubilee would have just left as well by that time. But you did play some absolutely memorable matches for the club. But before I get to that, there's one more thing I want to talk about. Falkirk, did you know, were you ever involved in any of the Dwight York nights up nights out at the Manakee? No, the Manakee, no, but it wasn't Rosie. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't. It come up. It come up one night. Uh, obviously, it was also. I think he drove up. I think he drove in the white Lamborghini or something like that. <laughs> really What's going on here? A white Lamborghini and um, driving around the street. Uh, walked up to Rosie, filled out a lot of cash to the bouncer following me all night, and the bouncer just followed him all night, so nothing happened for him and Russell parted away in Rosie's, which is quite surreal thinking in the career he had and, and stuff like that, but it was Russell's best mate, so, and I was Russell's boot boy, so I used to get filled out all the time on a Saturday to either, I'll, I'll, you know, drive his car because he was drinking, so I would need to drive his, I think he had like an X3 or something like that, <laughs> I had a drive his and drop them off home and take them to the next club and stuff like that, so, um, I, he, he did come up a few times to see Russell, I'm sure. <laughs> really enjoyed the lifestyle. I'm sure he's not seen that in life. As we say, com- compared to his hometown and uh, looking at the lovely sights and sounds of Falkirk, I have to be very similar on par, I'd imagine. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about men will match with the Saints. There's a couple I want to touch on, which you probably talked about a fair amount, but they're, they're always standouts for me. There's one game involving Hearts and a three all draw at McDermott. Ando got sent off for, a, if I remember rightly, it was a last man tackle on the halfway line. Yeah. You ended up the match in goals. Manus was sent off. It, it, it was a crazy, crazy match. I think Tommy Campbell actually ended up going to hospital after the match, if I remember right, and so did Murray Davidson with a leg injury. It was it was carnage. Where, what's your memories of that day, and how did you end up being the one to, to end up in the sticks? Maybe I'll put the hand up. So, <laughs> maybe, maybe. We had made our subs, we never had any choice, so I just said I'll go in. It was one of the, the as you say, the strangest games I've probably been involved in with Ambo sending off. Then Tommy had a, pretty much had a heart attack at half time, so the ambulance and that got called. Then and Murray done his patel attending, and, and then I find myself in goals for the last what, 10 15 minutes, and they kind of keep the ball. So I remember putting Big Alan shut on it, came down to my knees, and I was like, even after that, I think we played perfect like on the Tuesday and fourteen of highlighting if you remember there was like a big melee in the in the in the goals. Yeah. And I think for, I think my head must have slipped it looked like I tried to kind of put the heat into Brad McCall. But um I ended up getting pulled up and getting a two game suspension, so I missed like the least top ten against Aberdeen at uh, Pinecastle. And so my that so that just confounded obviously the result, obviously, because we were leader and then obviously I wasn't supposed to head up. But um, I, it was just surreal. So, you know, I've, I've never really liked goalkeepers. I find them quite strange people. Um, <laughs> I think they're a goalkeeper, they need to be strange, but 
you know, taking free kicks and by kicks a long way back at the goal and seeing everybody standing like six or seven yards away from me, it was quite nerve wracking. But um, I just always remember Tommy saying to me, and I came after the game, why did you not come for the cross? And I was like, just by laughing. Always a goalkeeper at heart, Tommy, right? I, the, the boy, I thought the boy, I thought the boy whipped it in, and then when I saw what by watched by the highlights, it was like the sportiest ball in the world, and I was like, why did I not come for that? But as I say, it's a, it was an experience that um, that I didn't enjoy, but someone had to do it, and it just what happened to me. There you go. Is it true? My mate spoke to Alan Manor somewhere, and it turns out he doesn't watch football or likes even likes football. Is that right? Nah, he doesn't. He likes um, likes like combat sports, the UFC, and that. So he was. So I used to travel in a, in a car with Al, so like me, Al. Uh, David Walsh and, and Maka so we used to travel in but I was like I was got a dry sense of humour as well so you, sometimes like sometimes you would drive into training and back up to training and wouldn't hear a lot about that sorry you just sit there quiet um, but sometimes they would take me to school so what we do in the gym and go in the pad and I'd be like alright I'll let's go so I'd go down and get the box in then he would start telling me to hold the pad so that it could get flying kicks and flying knees and I'm like oh I'm on here man you're like 97 k so I'm standing there like, with a the pad like this and he's grabbing my head and my shoulders and like me and me. And <laughs> and after, after one session, he asked me to go back to dinner. I said, nah, that's not for me. I'm, 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 I'm you know, just like a guy for me. But, um, but a great guy, great pro. So I went for the club. Um, obviously, I think Xander learned a lot under him as well, watching him went about and playing properly and doing the right things and that. But I have a very dry sense of humour, a bit like Ando, although Ando. Uh, good stuff Dan yeah I was just going to say I I don't think I've ever been surprised by anything less than the revelation that Alan Manis is really into combat sports (laughs) just like look at him and you think yeah there's a bloke who watches sort of really niche combat sports on (laughs) sports on challenge TV or something he was he was absolutely he was absolutely ripped as well to be fair he went to a stage where he was like obviously uh, looking after his body and that and he came in one day and it was like the transformation was overnight he went to like no having a six pack, having an eight pack, like he was really, really, really like, dedicated to his work, especially um, when we were going through such a good spell and that. He, he made sure that he looked after everything, but uh, a really, really great guy, a very, very quiet guy. When he shouted on the pitch, it was mostly probably at me, Midge, that he was going to kill him or something like that, <laughs> and then Midge would come, like, Midge, like, Midge, like, um, I know a great guy, and he just uh, done great for the club. Brilliant. Um, another match we'll touch on, for different reasons, Lucerne was a massive European game, as was Rosenberg. You were involved in both ties. I want to touch on Rosenberg away, especially. Not the match, <coughs> as, you, as, you may, as you may gather. Uh, I was speaking to my friend Ross, who, who was over in Lucerne, and he was nice enough to hand you back your bank card, which he found out in the main street. And he said, you might as well keep it, there's not much money in it. I need back my bank card. <laughs> which you'd apparently dropped out your back pocket <laughs> at some point, which is which is a nice I'm, touch of him. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. I can't really remember much uh, the <laughs> night of it. <laughs> Somebody put a photo up on Twitter, I think about a month ago, and all I can see is, like, I've got a tattoo that I got when I was, like, 15, right? I've got my name across my shoulders, big regret, but, like, maybe <laughs> in the young life. It happens. And this photo somebody, I can't even put it up, and I look for it, and all you can see is, like, almost on the back of somebody's shoulders in the middle of the square in Lucerne, and they stop on me, you know, the boys are the top now. And I didn't even know that. All I can remember is, we go back to the hotel, Tommy says you can have a cup of beers, have a cup of, I haven't added your drink, he also had a cup of glasses around the marker, the idea popped in there, on it, I don't know. As Marcus favourite saying is in for a penny and for a pound. So <laughs> we just kinda of, kind of diverted one by one out into the street. And I don't know how, but there was, there was a guy digging a manhole. And it must have been about two o'clock in the morning. So he digs a manhole at like two o'clock in the morning, eh? So we shout, <laughs> we shout them off. It's a red flag shout moment that, isn't it? That's what I mean. So we go through it and we're like, here yeah, we'll be a hundred euro or whatever it is, take a step to the pub. So we all pile in the back of these fans at van and then Drivers go to the square and say, like, I've got three beers and that. And things just like the doors open. Bob's your uncle, there's the chairman, there's the director, there's all the hand. So, what are we doing? Are we going out? Or are we not? So, and for a penny and for a pound, we're out. Let's go. <laughs> then we couldn't even get in to buy a drink because we had our track suits on. So, we had to stand outside. I mean, the fans had bought drinks all night. I think it was really, really expensive over there anyway. But no, it was a, it was a great night. The next thing in the morning was rough. I got in big trouble for the next thing in the morning because I was late for the bus. We were leaving at stupid o'clock in the morning. I had Paul Snack, the chief exec, chatting on my door uh, to get me to and clean up. And then somebody just told my trainer. I came running down with a trainer on and a flip flop on. And, um, <laughs> but thankfully, there was two doors on the bus. So there was the front, obviously, the front 
uh, door at the boss when it was one halfway up. I managed to go in the, the one that was halfway up. Oh, you're shy bag. I uh, bypassed the chairman and the manager and that, but I think the manager had had a meeting and was calling me all the names under the sun. And <laughs> I, was getting, I was getting less than with them and like, I was doing five minutes and stuff like that. So um, we came back, we got a really, a really, a really decent sign. Um, I think me and Mark have got a sign double to be late to the bus and stuff like that. But as you say, that's however many years on and people still talk about it because why would you not go and celebrate that with the fans? Yep, you're absolutely you know, right. It's like, it's like occasion, I mean, all right, it's not maybe a few hundred pounds in time money in that, but, you know, for, for fans that go to games and pay their hard earned money to see the players come out and bond to the fans and stuff like that, it makes for the, the experience a lot better. Right? It's kind of what the players don't get to see. Well, you didn't really get to see it in the pub either as you stood outside, but no, it was a, a cracking trip by all accounts. Lucerne home, like, again, you were the man in the spotlight. Tommy must have forgiven you after the stepping up for a penalty. Did you... Uh, did you put your hand up for it, as you did with going in goals? Did you say, right, I'm going to take number five? No, I was literally walking about, because I was looking around, I was thinking, right, there's cup size there, nasal's there, markers there. I was like, right, I'm not really going to put my hand up. I actually think it might have been. He disputes this, but I'm sure Chris Miller put his hand up and says, I'll take the fifth, and Tommy went, right, no. And <laughs> this one's going to say to me, so do you want to take it? And I went, no problem. I'll take it if you want. So obviously you're watching them kind of, Four and four and three, and you think, I'm just going to get to the last camp. <laughs> <laughs> people think to yourself, you're feeling that, you're like, oh, I'm really, really calm, but like, I duck underwater, your legs are gone. So, um, but no, I walks up, their guys find the saunter back and saying, hey, just to go back, and the big goalkeeper was there, and he said, mate, it's just me and you, it's just me and you. And I'm like, oh, I didn't expect anything less than this as well. So, um, just sort of up, and I've always heard this thing, and I've said it to players that I play with and coaches and that, and a decisive moment, and a penalty, I think the goalkeeper's got to die. I don't care what, if it's the last penalty in the 90th minute, if it's the, the last penalty in a penalty shoot, I think it takes a really, really big set of balls for a goalkeeper just to stand mm-hmm. still in the middle of the goal. So I always had it in, in my head at the time that he's got to die, because if he doesn't die, people say, well, why do you not die? So I thought, right. Just go hard in the middle, and uh, and the rest of history, and obviously the celebrations afterwards were for me, and it was great. Good to see the them kind of get a young team back in that corner again, especially at Kelty yesterday. Um, well, while we're at the subject, you, you played for Kelty. Well, you left Saints. We'll, we'll come back to that later. Let's touch on the match yesterday. Two former clubs here, St. Johnson and Kelty. You got to be delighted for your, your one of your former teams. Yeah, I texted on last night, congratulating on saying listen. Delighted for you, and obviously all the work that goes on behind the scenes, and the committee, and the volunteers are going, and obviously the boys, and they're having a great season, and you know, and it is a great result for them because you know it's it's, it's another milestone for them. We were obviously uh, on the first one and actually getting them into the league, so that was a milestone, and it was a big achievement for them. Now they went so it's all with the the holders and the cup and managed to put them out, which is a, another milestone. And, I'm sure the Kelly fans will be celebrated massively last night and uh, the enjoyment. Um, going on what I watched on the highlights, you know, I don't think it was a snatch and grab result. You know, they played their part in a really good game, obviously. St. Johnston had a few chances. But got a goal so far, obviously, the result for St. Johnston and obviously the situation they're in. I, mean, I speak to Marker quite a bit still. So, you know, no calm really well. I know they're on a difficult run. I'm sure they've been looking at that game thinking right before they've got a good performance, that result, and then they can kick on. Uh, after the winter break, but you know these things happen in, in cup football. It can always be a banana skin. And if, 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 if it was a tie where you could see it up to happen and the run that we has been on, it was always going to be that one. Absolutely right, Daniel. Yeah, um, just about Kelty really, because so I was down there yesterday, and it's it seems to be a good settle we've got going, and it's a really good team. Um, when you were there, obviously going back not a particularly long time, but sort of long enough. Could you see the progress going? Were they looking to get to the stage they're at now? Was that, did that seem to be the ambition around the club? Yeah, that's, that's partly the reason why I went there. Um, once Barry Ferguson phoned me and asked me to come in, I uh, spoke to Barry, I played against him and that, so I, knowed, I knew the kind of character that he was and he wouldn't be there if he never knew that they were, they were in the attendance and they were going to go and try and do stuff. I spoke to the owner, and uh, he was a really, really nice guy. Heart's fully invested in the Celtic, you know, 
they've got fans putting places well to be holding and extending the stadium. So mm-hmm. where the dugouts were last night, there'll be a a, a city of in the stand going there where they're going to have their changing rooms and a gym and obviously boxes and stuff like that. So he's he's got all these plans already approved. Um, for Celtic to just kind of grow and get bigger and get bigger and obviously the biggest thing for them was getting in the league. I think that was that the hardest part for public Celtic and season alone was actually getting into the 42 man um, SPL, SPFL or we thought. So now that they're there, I didn't see them coming back out. I think the team's got the ambition to, to back them. Um, obviously the results like last night and getting good funds in the cup then financially it was really, really good for them and um, stuff like that. But yeah, the, the ambition's always been there. I'm sure that's why Kevin has been the job as well. Obviously, Kevin was uh, very comfortable at Rangers uh, and their coaching, so it's, uh, it's probably a bit of a gamble for him to come out with still time coaching at Rangers to, to go to a club like Celtic in all Yeah, they're absolutely flying at the moment, and as you say, well deserving of their win yesterday. How does, you'll obviously, you worked under Callum, and obviously you're good pals with Maka. As a pair, how do they how do they turn this around now? Million dollar question. Perfect. Listen, I ask. It's hard because obviously they're on this losing run and, you know, confidence will be short in some of the boys and that, but I'm sure Calm and Maka will be working as hard as it is in the first day that they came in, even harder. You know, I speak to Maka, he's always talking to how they're looking at footage, going over stuff, making sure that everything's in place and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's difficult as a manager because you can set everything up and do everything you want in the training but some things are it's not implemented in the game. You know, you're kind of scratching your head. I saw him say that in the first half he had asked the boys to do things that he wanted them to do and they never done it. I mean, that must be really frustrating as a coach if you've implemented some things and kind of leading up to the game and you've been specific about these things and then they go in the first half and they don't really do it. You know, you're, you're starting to scratch it even saying, well, why, why are you not doing it as a last to do it? So, you know, it's, it can't, it can't always come down to the manager and, and the coaching staff. I think the players have got to take a big responsibility as well. I mean, no offence to Kelly, but whoever plays for St. Johnson yesterday should be going out. You know, they're three, two, two leagues above. You know, Scottish Cup holders, they should be going out and winning that game quite comfortably. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, they're on a kind of a, a losing streak now, and it, and it can just be a switch. You know, it can just be a, a wee bit of luck here, a wee bit of luck there, and, and your season can change. I remember under Tommy, we would go with about four or five games, so we'd be on a very, really, really bad losing spell. Um, and then you pick up that first one, and then for some reason you, you pick on. So, you know, I'm sure Calm and Maka and the rest of the coaching staff will be working uh, ever so hard behind the scenes to bring more success to the club because, you know, Calm are an absolute club legend along with Stephen McLean. You know, the, the club's still at the, at the centre of their heart. I'm sure they want the club to be well. They're no, they're no there just to pick up a wage and stuff like that. As we record, uh, Twitter and Facebook and the likes is going crazy, pointing the finger here, there, and everywhere where, where it's going to go wrong. One of the fingers is uh, the chairman promised to spend some money and it doesn't seem like that's happened. Now, that kind of reminded me of the time when you left the club. You said you were quoted to say uh, a wee while back that 99.9% of your time at the club was great, but there was that little smidgen of disappointment with the way you kind of left the club. Now, for people who don't know the backstory, you were, you're offered a one-year deal on 35%, I believe, less money than what you're on at the moment, feeling undervalued by the club. Now... Do you still do you still hold a grudge over this? Is that is it still annoying to this day that you, you went because you were a part of the team? But these things happen in football, obviously at the time. I wanted to stay at the club. Uh, I've been here for five years, been in Europe every year, competing in the top six, winning cups and stuff like that. Been part of a, a really, really good bunch of boys and a manager who, you know, gave me full confidence to go and play and when I didn't play, to tell me why I didn't play and, and stuff like that. So, you know, I think it just shivered it a wee bit at the end because I had a really good relationship with the chairman as well. You know, they're a good bit of banter and stuff like that. But um, I think in any job, really, if you got asked to take a 35% wage cut, you would start looking elsewhere. And um, not just football, but in, in general life and stuff like that. And, and I get that, you know, they would like to cut some costs and stuff like that. But I think um, <laughs> it was difficult because you try and go back and count all and stuff like that. But it never really succumbed to anything. So, you know, it was. I was, I was disappointed and I think most of Johnson fans will probably understand why I left. You know, if, I mean, if you go off of 35% in your job for an hour year, but somebody else offers you more money, then uh, at the end of the day, football's a short career, you know. It's, 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 it
know, I say he's fine for me, right? He was on the phone all the time, ready to say and what me to say. Uh, so, you know, it was actually a tough decision because at the end of the day, I thought to myself, well, you know, for for me, well, I stay and just take the 35% cut. But, you know, financially and that, I thought, nah, like, you know, sometimes you just need to stick to your guns and say, this is what I'm worth. I wasn't asking for any more money or stuff like that. So I just said, like, just give me what I'm on now and I'll be happy to stay for another year and we'll continue the voice of the public. Brilliant. But, you know, the chairman didn't speak that way. So, you know, these things happen in football. There's a lot of worse things that could have happened in football and stuff like that. But, as I say, the B's actually see 0.1% where it was a bit teased off at the way it ended. But other than that, I mean, nowadays, you know, I've actually been doing a bit of coaching the manager at Eric and that, and I can kind of see precisely the story and how he has to manage his budget and, and what get players in and get players out and stuff like that. So, you know, that's that's what I'm under the bridge. I'm sure if I've seen the more of just to sell by my time to see how it's going to Exactly. Um, very well said. Now you touched on there, we'll, we'll finish up. Well, actually, you've got a young kid under the age of two months old. You probably want to ch- chat to us all day to, to, to not get stuck in and involved. Well, just like a for a few That's it. What's next for Tam? You're still obviously playing with Berwick Rangers at the moment. Are you, you're looking to get into management, coaching? Yes, looking to get into coaching and management. Been fortunate enough that Kelty with Barry and Bob Luck and the bits and pieces of the guys there and then obviously the field at the at Berwick, whenever I've been injured or that, he's asked me to uh, come on and help him in the coaching side. And that. It's something that I'm quite passionate about. I speak to Marker quite a bit, uh, quite a lot about it, uh, in terms of uh, session plans and stuff like that. So for me, I think, I think I knew quite early that that's something I wanted to do. Uh, so I, I've been trying to gear up here to kind of try to do as much uh, coaching work as I can. Obviously, the big thing is going and doing your, your coaching badges. But mm-hmm. A wee bit of time and stuff like that, so it's just been trying to think the right time. Obviously, the last couple of years have been hampered through COVID. I think a lot of them have been doing it online on computer and through Zoom. I think I'd much prefer to be on the training pitch and try and do it and stuff like that. So that's, uh, that's definitely something I'll be looking to, to get into. Brilliant. Uh, just as you were talking there, uh, you're talking about training badges and uh, you mentioned Steve McLean. We were speaking to, I think it was Chris Miller, who said that uh, he had to go off and do his training badges the Monday after the Scottish Cup final. That would have been a tasty old trip. And I was there on the Saturday night and the Sunday night, so I know, I know exactly what he was doing. Like. <laughs> um, but that's the thing, I mean, it, it, it's a tough one because sometimes I'm like, you might need to go and, as you say, after the Scottish Cup final in May, you might need to go and do like an eight day and down at large or whatever. I think it's moved to maybe to Edinburgh and that now. So it's just kind of time, obviously time around the uh, family and work and stuff like that. But it's definitely something that, that I'll be looking to do uh, really soon. I was planning on doing it uh, 18 months ago, but as I say, the COVID and that means that I matter. Exactly, and I'm sure we will see you in the top flights of uh, Scottish football again, doing your coaching stuff. But Tam, very much appreciate you coming on to speak to us today, uh, and we'll hope to again we'll speak to you very, very soon. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Tom. Have a good one, buddy. Man. Take care, mate. Good Thanks, man. See ya. Flonix offers flexible IT support, professional IT project delivery, and expert IT advice. Our head office is based in Perth, but with offices in Edinburgh, Manchester, and London, we service most areas within the UK. We can support any size of company and we excel in delivering fast, reliable and accountable service to our clients. We take a flexible approach to IT, which is determined by our clients' business needs. We can operate as the client's IT department or add to an existing IT resource within the company. Our people are highly trained professionals who have the expertise to access, repair and maintain any PC, server, network or Apple Mac system. Check out flonix.co.uk for all the details. Nice guy, eh? Oh, terrific. An absolute smasher of a guy. Um, very intelligent lad, very sort of thoughtful lad about football. Um, some great stories, yeah. A really enjoyable interview. And I know he's looking to stay in the game and get into coaching, as you mentioned. Uh, I think he'd be a, I think he'd be a real asset to whoever takes a chance on him. He looks like Benjamin Button. He looks younger now than he did playing for Saints. I know. Well, have you seen his Wikipedia page? I said um, that. I thought he's got on there. Yeah, ridiculous. I know from his um, Scotland under 21s days, which we didn't mention, and probably would have been a nice thing for him to be like. No, no, let's talk, must have got, let's talk about getting punched some, by Alan Manners. Yeah, yeah, we'll go with that. Someone's obviously, um, I've noticed we have a few, few players, like when I'm on Wikipedia Ramble, someone's obviously got the license for that photo, like a team photo from the um, whatever game that was for the under 21s, because like 
Stephen McGinn and a few others have got their picture from that game. That is a Wikipedia photo. Nice. But uh, no, thanks again to Tam Scobie. We've got loads of great guests lined up as well. One person who we talked about last week, actually, who said it'll be a massive deal if we can get him on. He might be coming on the next couple of weeks. Uh, we can announce that person has given us his word that he's going to come on at the end of the season. And we're very much looking forward to welcoming on former St. Johnson manager Tommy Wright to the Dogger Saints podcast at the end of the season. That'll be amazing. Uh, true, man. It's been in contact with Tommy. Um, he's been absolutely great with us, we'd like to say. And um, yeah, obviously, just wants to wait until the end of the season, but he's um, given us his word and he's nothing of not a man of his word, I don't think. So yeah, it'll be, um, I'm absolutely thrilled that Tommy's, uh, Tommy's agreed to come and have a chat with us and hopefully um, could be a real belter for, for all you guys listening. Indeed, I hope so as well. But this could also be a belter for you guys listening. <laughs> it's another new feature. It's Lynn's Diary, Dan. I can't believe we're doing this. <laughs> uh, this could be I very interesting. I can't believe we're doing this. So the backstory is I've been in the house with COVID all week. And what I have done is I've gone to the loft to pack some stuff away and I've discovered a diary from 1997 and it's Lynn's. So she would have been 14, 15 years old at the time. And my goodness, what an absolute classic. Uh, going on to the 4th of March, she's lit, written a list called Lynn Fancies. Do you, want to, do you want to hear the list of who Lynn fancies? I don't want her to murder me <laughs> for getting involved in this. But at the same time, I really want to get involved in this. So, <laughs> you know, these are the chances that you take. This is it. This could be, This is the kind of content we need. So Lynn, uh, on the 4th of March, 1997, wrote in our diary that she was she fancied Lee, Jimmy and Spike, the founding members of Boy Band 911, I presume. She was a big fan yeah, of that. Is that who they were? Yeah, uh, Lee Brown. And- Lee, Jimmy and Spike? Yeah, Jimmy Constable and Spike Dobbard. She's written her full name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Grant Kerr. I don't know who that is. Stuart Kerr. Hopefully that's not her brother. That's a bit sick. Could be twins. I'll need to look into this. And the best name on this list, <laughs> Jodie Morris. <laughs> <laughs> Future St. Johnson midfielder Jodie Morris made a... Uh, was he a handsome looking guy back in the day? He was tiny. Still is. No, he was a weasley looking little guy when he was at Chelsea. Um, say this because I know he doesn't listen to this and won't, and won't entertain speaking to us. So he's on, he's one of them. I think a lot of, like a lot of us, um, look an awful lot better as we get older than we did when we were little skinny 17, 18 year olds. Yeah, he's he, he's aged like a fine wine. But we'll go to the 3rd of June where uh, she's written a, a kind of a letter to Lee Spike and Jimmy of 911. She must have been quite the fan back in the day. I, so- I, 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 I should point out, I've seen this. No, no, you've not seen but this. I want to hear you. Oh, no, you have seen this one. Yeah, this is the one you have seen. Um, so, so, I want to hear you read it. So it says, to Lee, Spike, and Jimmy, I will always love all three of you. Lee, you are so luscious. Spike, you are so sexy. <laughs> and Jimmy, you are so juicy. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of love, Lynn. Oh my God. Uh, and, on, and on the next page, she's written, uh, Dear 911, words cannot describe how I feel about you. You mean everything to me. You are the air that I breathe. You are the grass that I walk upon. She's written roads, but scored it out and gone with grass. <laughs> <laughs> I, you are the grass that it I does, walk that upon. It's more, rom- rom- more romantic setting, you know, the grass in the fields than, um, you know, sort of. Hitch- side of an A-roll or something like that. <laughs> Hitchhiking up the M9. Uh, and final, right. finally, we'll go to the 5th of March. Uh, I'm going to Falkirk with Jules on Sunday, and she's wearing a range a- RFC top, Adidas trackies, trainers, and Kappa jacket. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's painting uh, p- painting quite the picture. Time. Mum's running me to Grangemouth at 10, and then me and Jules are getting bus up a while later. Might see Grant. I presume looking at the previous post, this is Grant Kerr. Right, yeah. But she, um, but she scored I'm, this out and it said, don't want to. <laughs> so obviously... <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> what did Grant do? Well, we all, I'll need to find out. I'll try and get some more info, but that's all I've got for this yeah. week's uh, entry on uh, Lynn's diary. Absolutely. I've, 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 got a couple, I've got a couple of points to pick out, sorry, before we wrap that up. <laughs> Go on. Um, firstly, so my sister is the same age as um, sort of you and Lynn. And yeah, the fashion sense of a kappa jacket and was it Adidas trackies? Adidas trackies, yep. Yeah. Uh, trainers would it, and kappa would it, jacket. It, would he pop a pants? Yeah, they would have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I remember that. Um, that was that was a bold look. <laughs> um, and the when you sent me through the one, the only bit of that I'd actually seen was the um, the letter to Lee Spike and Jimmy. Um, I thought that Lee Spike and Jimmy were 
classmates of his. <laughs> when you first sent it through, obviously, because why would I? I didn't know they would have found the members of uh, boy band 911. So I'm actually quite relieved. Yeah, well, yeah, that's more of a like, Lee Jimmy and Spike. It was more Lee Brennan, the lead singer she was obsessed with. Now, back in the day, Lee's mum had a pub called the Pedestrian Arms in Carlisle, which Lynn made her mum drive her to in Carlisle. And basically what she did was just went into the pub, asked if Lee was there, said no, so she nicked some pot puri and left. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous. Pot puri, oh, the classic really? 90s uh, make your house smell good item. Oh, what a world. But if you'd like to hear more from Lynn's diary, um, I can do another run next week, but we're going to we're gonna go back to the blame game, unfortunately. I blame, oh, I blame Lynn for a lot of things, but uh, we're going to look at the players and their role in the downturn of St. Johnson's form. Um, sorry, quickly. Go so, on. Um, I think we can nip this bit in the bud um, because... I think we should just lay all the all the blame on Jimmy Constable of 911. <laughs> he was on Jeremy Kyle, remember that? He was, he was a sex addict. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> and uh, I remember Spike, I know all about them. Spike lived in Warrington, uh, where my brother lives now, and Lee, yeah, still lives in Carlisle. He's a personal trainer now. He's still, he's a still good looking boy. Oh, yeah, you, you know, might, might not lose that. But Spike, I mean, that's unfortunate for him, A, having to live in Warrington and B, having to live in the same place where your brother lives. Yeah, um, no idea. I was always wondering no, why Lynn uh, always wanted to go down and see my brother. Now I know. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, because it, it probably wouldn't have been to go and see Kev. I'm joking, Kev. I love you, mate. <laughs> Um, right, the players, we'll talk about this very briefly, but I think that there's, they're devoid of confidence, absolutely void of it altogether. Looking at the Celtic game, nobody really wanted to get the ball, nobody wanted to make a mistake, heads were down after the goal, it's been a running form all season. How much responsibility do they have to take on this? Oh, uh, totally. And there's, you've, you've got to have some sort of personal responsibility as footballers. However, this is why, in fact, the situation with the players and whether you, and you know, their role in the downturn. It's actually like a bit of a microcosm of the whole thing because it's really complex and there's no, I know, yeah, no, Danny threw in a, Danny threw in a big word. Micro, um, what, what was the word, sorry, say it again? Microcosm. Nice. Like that, in, but in smaller form. Um, so it's it actually, um, it just sort of sums up the whole situation because it isn't easy. It is complex. There's no one answer. The, I'll be fair to the players first. Um, they are shot of confidence. Like totally shot, and you can tell for whatever reason. I just think it's relent. It's just relentless at the minute. It's just defeat after defeat after defeat. Do you think that's the only reason that they're playing poorly is because of a shot of confidence? Now I'm going to be a bit no. controversial and say maybe one or two may have down tools. I don't like saying it because, um, but you, I, I don't know. I, I, Maybe not down it tools. I think, like, I think down in tools may be harsh. I think maybe had their head turned yeah. would be a fairer statement. I, I I think some of them might have done. I don't think there's any any question about that. And a lot of footballers, um, don't forget, don't blame. Short career. Mm-hmm. But what is long but when you're on short contracts, which I think is probably part of the reason why a lot of these lads coming in are being given longer deals, is the fact that um you're on a short contract, then and you've got pre con, you know, PCA's kicking about. Everyone in the basically everyone in the league is going to offer more money than Saints. But the the, down, Short the, the downturn in form of a certain Jamie McCart has been astronomical from last season to this season. He looks he's just long diagonal balls. It's just it's it's horrible to watch. I mean, this is the thing, and this isn't just the players, the football is absolutely rubbish. It is hopeless. It's it's just eye bleedingly bad. And I know there'll probably be people listening to other clubs like, oh, we told you, you know, that. I, you know you're, you're, we said for ages you play rubbish football. I'm not, I, all right, we set up sort of safety first a little bit last season. The football was good. We got the ball on the deck and played it about. Don't get me wrong, I mean, we can go in. It was a big thing. It was a big factor in the fact we don't get the ball down anymore and play it through the midfield. Spoonie being out is another massive factor in that. But you look at the way they're doing it. Like you say, it's the midfield's actually the big problem we've got. Because you wouldn't lose games of football in midfield. And our midfield is just all over the place, really. There's some and there's good players in there. There's really good players, but for whatever reason, it's just we're getting overrun in midfield all the time. But they're not getting a chance to get the ball down and play the ball about a bit. And when they did it at Tynecastle on Tuesday, 
you could actually you actually thinking, oh, hold on, yeah, this is probably this. You know, we might have something going here, but the amount of games this season where the midfield just basically seems to, and I don't know whether it's the players and I don't know whether it's the manager, but the midfield just looks like it's there as a sort of another bank of the defence. Everything's going up, everything's getting bypassed in attack every time. Everything's either getting darted out to the fullbacks who aren't playing very well, like Jamie McCart's long diagonals out to the right. Any moron, any moron could see. Any, like, even the most thickest pig shit fullback <laughs> will be able to snuff that out when it's happening every single time. And a winger will double up with it. It's, it's so easy to defend against. The other thing that's happening is when the ball's going forward, if it's not going diagonal, it's going straight at Kane. Now, Kano did brilliant the last season at sort of holding the ball up, bringing others into play. Look at where he was at his best, though, when the ball was into his feet. Mm-hmm. Where is he getting it? Where is he getting it now? He's getting it head height, chest height. And so all he can do is try and win a foul because he's up there on his own. He's totally isolated. Midfield's not support. He's not getting any support from midfield. He's got no wingers. I say he's up there on his own. He's now started playing two with Shifty in there. But it, it's it's oh, it, it's bad. Um, so I, I don't know whether that helps with the confidence because they can't be enjoying playing that sort of football. No, they're, they're professionals. At the end of the day, they, they might still be hurting, but they need to use that heart and just transfer. The, Eric Nicholson made a very good point today was fans should back the players who basically won the cup last week. We need to be that 12th man. We need to back, give them the support. It will help. It 100% will help. I think, I'm hoping that what happened on Saturday, in a weird way, it might have needed to happen. So I think everyone got on the same, I think everyone got on the same page. Mm-hmm. But now once it sort of calms down and settled down, I tell you what, the players will know. It's like if you have an argument with someone, in it? It's like you have a Barney and you might be walking off on bad terms or something like that. But then next time you walk into the pub and they're there, you know, you're like, ah, there you go. Ah, here he is. Oh, well, they let anyone in this place now, don't they? <laughs> so it's like, it's going to be like that. You watch what happens when them players come out of the tunnel at McDermott on, on Wednesday night against Sunday. You listen to the reaction they get from the fans because they'll just be desperate to bloody kiss and make up. So it's all out of the system and hopefully the players have took Hopefully the players have took what happened after the Kelty game and they're thinking, because I don't actually think players and fans need to, I don't think players particularly need to like the supporters. So even if the, the reaction is, oh, fucking show them or yeah. whatever, or if the reaction's the other way, and like, oh, geez, you know, we really want the fans back up. You know, we need to get the fans back. It hopefully just inspires something in them. Yeah, they can um, just, as long as they channel that that anger one way or another, as long as it as they can turn that into a positive. It, yeah, you can. You absolutely can. So I think there is an attitude thing with the players and maybe, cha- like you say, channeling that. Um, I mean, it's a confidence thing with the players. As we've discussed, they need to get all, they need to be a bit stronger upstairs and they need to get over this thing when you go one down, that it's over. And I know it can be difficult to keep picking yourself up and going to the well, but they've got to. They've absolutely got to. Otherwise, the fucks. And I still think there's a way out of this, this mess. But the way it's going at the minute, but it's obvious it's obvious where we're going to be next season if it carries on this way. But it's going to be a fight now. It's absolutely going to be a fight for those players. And you could see on last Tuesday and this Saturday, you could see who the new lads in the squad were because they were the ones that looked like they were buzzing about, like they had something to go. They were the ones who didn't look scarred and didn't look like, you know, they were the ones who looked like they wanted to be there or either, either looked like they wanted to be there or didn't look scarred. It's going to be a fight, and uh, the new signing, John Mahon, John Mahon, however you pronounce it. Mahon. 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 He, Mahon, um, he came in this week, you know, came in and said, his interview said all the right things. He said, I'm here for a fight. I'm going to scrap it. We need that attitude. Well, that needs to be put into practice. We need that attitude. And let me tell you, if you're not up for the fight, fuck off. If you're not up for this, get yourself out the fucking door in the next week because... Is because you know we're used. You need to use the ornament. Go on, honestly. Kevin Keegan. Go on. No, that's it. <laughs> I mean, he went down in my estimation when he said that. When you say that about play, that play like Stuart Pierce, <laughs> um, honestly, it's no, it's, no, it's going to sound harsh, but just if you don't want to be there and you want to be somewhere else, you you're going to get what you want at the end of. The, they're going to get what they want at the end of the season, ultimately, because they'll go. They'll they'll get a move, but then we're like collateral in that. We're 
Wait, God, and it's same with Callum. Callum's going to learn, just not to go back to my, but Callum's going to learn as a manager to be less stubborn. This is going to be the learning curve, but we could end up being collateral in that. He, he might learn when we go that, and he's buggered off somewhere else, as he's probably going to at some point in his career. So, yeah, ultimately, it's, it's going to have to be one massive, giant, collective thing to get us back on the straight and narrow and maybe get out of this situation we're in. And if you're not up for that, and if you want to be outside that, then be well outside it. Be, like, well outside it, as in you're not in, in Perth. Exactly right. And there's no better place to start as on Wednesday against Dundee, the particular nine-pointer we have got coming up against them. We will talk about that all next week, as well as the Aberdeen game on Saturday, but we cannot underestimated just how important this match is on Wednesday, Dan. Massive. Absolutely massive. What an opportunity. I'm not going to call it a derby because I'm fed up at that part. Um, <laughs> I'm not starting that again. No, it's obviously it's local rivals. Not just local rivals, but the ones who are down in the muck with us. And as you say, Sam, it's not a six-pointer, it's a bleeding nine-pointer. Yeah. We need to... Uh, but what a chance. What, an, what a chance for everyone. And as unappealing as it might be, get a big crowd in, get a good atmosphere going. Get, and hopefully, and that's all we can do as fans, and hopefully the players sort of reciprocate that by, and the manager, by really, really having a goal and really trying to be proactive in getting out of this mess and putting a marker down. Next week could be a very different podcast if we get a result on Wednesday and, a, more importantly, a brilliant performance with it. Thank you very much for listening this week. It's been a bit lengthier than usual, but hopefully you've got something out of this. Support the club. That's all we can ask. Uh, get behind the boys on Wednesday and on Saturday up at Bataudry. Thanks to my colleague and co-host Dan, who has been brilliant again this week. This is our second take. We accidentally deleted the first lot. No, I, did, I didn't say deleted. It was corrupted. A corrupted file. It was corrupted. So we had to re-record the whole thing, but I think we were sounding clearer than normal this week, which is which is a good thing. We also have to thank Flonix as well. As you know, Flonix offers flexible IT support, professional IT project delivery, and expert IT advice. Go to flonix.co.uk for all your IT needs. And go to iTunes if you want to listen to more uh, the back catalogue of 911. That's a good place to go. That's what we need. But yeah, just let's all, come on, more and all, let's get together, pull it together, and hopefully the players reciprocate that on the pitch. Look, and at the end of it, we, we've just got help about, particularly me, we've got help about it for the last couple of hours on here. But it's, look... We've seen enough in the last couple of days to know that don't fall out with each other over it. Don't slag each other off. It's just there's a lot of things that have put um, put football into perspective over the last few days. And let's just... Do the song. We wouldn't be without it. And you know what else we wouldn't be without? The musical stylings of me, your handsome old dad, Danny Williams. And I'm going to see us out Go! F-L-O, N-I-X. If you can spell it, Guidi will instead. It's Flonix and they do IT solutions that I think are nice. So if your IT needs a men, then Flonix are your friends and they support the doggers with pride. Once again, get it up, you Guidi. Up the Perth Saints. Come on, you lot. We'll see you next week as we're off the bottom of the table. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.